Good afternoon, and welcome to our panel on the benefits and prospects of free trade and environmental goods. My name is Ina Monik. I'm a research fellow at the Cato Institute's Herbert A. Stiefel Center for Trade Policy Studies, and I will be your moderator for today's session. We'll have a discussion for about 45 minutes, which will be followed by Q&A. If you have a question, please put it in the Slido question box. And if you're tweeting during the event, please use the hashtag CatoTrade, and you will get your questions to us directly. So what brings us here today? At the end of November, the World Trade Organization will host its 12th ministerial conference, bringing together trade ministers from around the world to discuss a wide range of trade issues. Among them, the intersection of trade and environmental sustainability has been an area of growing importance. Back in 2014, negotiations to liberalize trade and environmental goods began with the aim of removing tariffs on a select group of environmental related products. Now, this is a fast growing global market estimated in 2016 at over $1 trillion in annual trade. It is also a market in which the United States is a leader. In 2015, U.S. exports of environmental goods totaled $238 billion, and it grew 6% annually since 2012. Lowering barriers to trade in environmental goods will not only empower Americans to have access to a wider range of environmental products, such as renewable energy and technologies to combat air pollution, but also open foreign markets to innovative American technologies. But the talks to reduce these barriers on environmental goods hit a snag just two years into the discussions, with disagreements simmering over such basic things as what is an environmental good anyways. Now, while a deal on liberalizing trade on environmental goods may not be possible at this year's ministerial conference, which is just weeks away, this conference should present an opportunity to sort of lay the groundwork and think of a roadmap for how we can conclude these negotiations in the future. Now, President Biden has made tackling climate change a top priority for his administration, and trade is but one avenue through which he can achieve this goal. It is also an issue for which there is bipartisan support. In fact, this past April, a group of House Democrats introduced a congressional resolution urging President Biden to resume within 90 days these long deadlock negotiations on environmental goods. They declared that restarting negotiations represents a significant opportunity to help countries across the world access high quality, affordable environmental products, while also leveling the playing field for American manufacturers and providing good green jobs. Two weeks later, Republicans on the House Ways and Means Committee also echoed their support similarly in a letter to U.S. Trade Representative Catherine Tai. Today, I am honored to introduce to you the sponsor of the resolution to restart talks on the Environmental Goods Agreement, Congresswoman Susan Delbene of Washington's first electoral district. Representative Delbene is the chair of the New Democrat Coalition, a caucus committed to pro-economic growth, pro-innovation, and fiscally responsible policies. She has also been a leader in environmental conservation and today joins us to speak to us about why reducing barriers to trade and environmental goods should be on the Biden administration's agenda. With that, Representative Delbene, the floor is yours. Thank you, Eno. I really appreciate it. It's great to be with all of you here today. And I want to thank the Cato Institute for hosting this important discussion, as well as Maureen Hinman and former Representative James Baucus, who will be offering their expertise on the importance of free trade and environmental technologies and how the U.S. can once again lead in these areas. Um, as President Biden often likes to say, we're at an inflection point as a nation. This is true in many ways, but especially so in our response to the increasingly dire threat of climate change. The warming climate is an existential threat to our way of life, health, national security, and economic prosperity. However, current government efforts to cut carbon emissions globally are falling short. According to a recent United Nations report, current government plans to reduce carbon emissions put the world on track to see a temperature rise of 2.7 degrees Celsius by the end of the century, nearly double the goal we committed to under the Paris Climate Agreement. Even with the recent COP26 conference and the commitments made by countries, our global response isn't enough right now to stop the changing climate. In my home state of Washington, historic and once in a generation extreme weather events like heat waves, droughts, and wildfires are becoming the new normal. 
Um, this past summer, the Pacific Northwest experienced a series of heat waves, including a June heat dome where temperatures reached as high as 120 degrees Fahrenheit, wiping out many of our agricultural crops, threatening outdoor workers and the elderly and causing nearly 200 deaths. Put the extreme heat and wildfires in the Pacific Northwest together with the devastating flooding in the Midwest and more powerful hurricanes on the East Coast and you can see the impact humans are having on our cli planet's climate. So now is the time for bold action on climate change. That's why I'm a strong supporter of the bipartisan infrastructure deal, which I voted for on Friday. And President Biden um, is working to sign this week, as well as the Build Back Better Reconciliation Bill that the House is planning to advance this month. Together, these landmark pieces of legislation will reduce carbon emissions, transition us to a greener economy, support good paying green jobs, modernize our port infrastructure that is critical to trade, and reestablish America as a leader on the global stage. However, the United States is only responsible for 13% of global emissions. So to cl combat climate change, domestic policy isn't enough. We need a global approach to climate. And that means the United States must address climate change through domestic policy and collective action. Part of that approach must be for increased market access for environmental technologies produced in America and other market economies and lead globally to reduce tariff on green products. As Inu noted, earlier this year, I introduced a resolution with several of my colleagues on the Ways and Means Committee, urging the administration to restart EGA negotiations, which would incentivize trade in products like wind turbines and solar water heaters. With tariffs as high as 50% on certain environmental products, eliminating these foreign tariffs would encourage the use of green products and help countries transition to a clean energy economy. Further, it's important to note that although the US is a recognized leader in the development of environmental technologies, we are often behind China or the European Union in world exports. US tariffs on these products are also generally much lower relative to China, the EU, and our other trading partners. A worker-centric trade policy in green goods can fix this imbalance. Eliminating foreign tariffs on these products would help level the playing field for American manufacturers and workers and support the growth of green American jobs. What's more, reducing tariffs on environmental technologies is supported by Democrats and Republicans, um, which is not always uh, as easy to find these days. So, so where should we go from here? To answer that question, it's important to first ask ourselves why EGA negotiations ultimately failed, what we can learn from those negotiations and how we can adjust our approach moving forward. And in this respect, it's important to note that EGA's collapse was orchestrated by a single member, China, which is currently the world's largest emitter of carbon, as well as the largest exporter of environmental goods. And while the US leads on environmental product quality and has strong domestic environmental regulations, we export a relatively low level of green goods compared to China, which has extremely weak environmental protections. China takes advantage of relatively low foreign tariffs to lead the world in green exports, despite lacking the demand to import green products itself, creating an imbalance where China benefits from the status quo. So moving forward, the Biden administration should consider whether as a first step um, to re restart negotiations in a smaller multilateral forum that excludes China and other non-market actors, such as the G7, the US-EU Trade and Technology Council, or the OECD. In these fora, I'd like to see the US work together with like-minded nations to establish an updated list of green goods and potentially green services before taking on the more difficult challenge of fully restarting EGA negotiations. So as a member from Washington state, the most trade dependent state in the nation with roughly 40% of our jobs tied to trade, I recognize the importance of market share and the challenge trade barriers pose to our export economy. And I'm also seeing firsthand the impacts of climate change on my state. So I'll continue to urge the administration, my colleagues in Congress and my counterparts overseas that free trade in environmental goods is pro-growth, pro-American worker and critical as part of a comprehensive plan to combat climate change. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions you might have and I'll pass the microphone back over to you, Inu. Thanks. 
Great, thank you. I, I like how you characterize this as an inflection point. And I think you know, when you in introduced that resolution, it made a lot of us who've been following EJ talks for quite some th think, hey, this is an opportunity for us to start that conversation again and, and get the ball moving. Now, the, the question I, I have for you on this is, you know, what has been the response that you received from the administration uh, when you had put forward that resolution? They've been generally reluctance to engage in substantial trade negotiations up until this point, but do they seem willing to take on this issue because it intersects with so many other things that they're trying to achieve right now? Well, definitely combating climate change, um, promoting green technologies, they have been clearly top priorities for the Biden administration, and it's likely the top priority when it comes to foreign policy. And I know at um, COP26, we're seeing the Biden administration lead on important agreements to curb emissions and shift to clean energy and promote sustainable agriculture and food systems. But we have not seen a clear commitment to restart EGA negotiations. Um, the Biden administration has really an opportunity here to increase trade in green products to benefit American workers and industry. And as I said before, I think this is an important part of a worker-centric and a climate-oriented trade agenda. So um, while we've not seen the administration publicly attempt to restart EGA negotiations, we recently saw the creation of a climate and clean tech working group during the first US-EU Tech and Trade Council um, meeting in Pittsburgh this past September. And that working group is tasked with finding opportunities and incentives to support transatlantic trade in green products. So that could be a good area for the administration to jumpstart conversations to reduce tariffs on green goods and services. And I'm also looking forward to see what climate commitments are announced at the 12th WTO ministerial conference that'll take place later, later this month. Absolutely. And, and given the fact that negotiations haven't been resumed yet, we still have some time to sort of figure out what these will look like this time around. Uh, what are some steps that you think the United States can take now uh, to put ourselves in a better position to lead on these negotiations when we do restart them? question. And first, I think we need to have strong domestic climate policies so that we have a very strong position when we are negotiating at the international table. Um, that means um, passing important infrastructure and climate investments. And like the infrastructure deal that passed the House on Friday, um, as well as the Build Back Better Act that the House is planning to advance this month, uh, these bills will reduce carbon emissions and modernize our trade infrastructure. And second, the U.S. should evaluate why EGA negotiations ultimately failed in 2016 and how we can adjust our approach going forward. And I think, um, you know, we should consider working in smaller multilateral fora um, with like-minded economies to create an updated list of what constitutes an environmental good. As you mentioned, there's been some um, a lack of clarity on that. And it should be a principled list based on the science and allow flexibility for new technologies to be added at later times. And then third, I think we need to continue advocating for freer trade and environmental goods so that when the time comes, the president will have broad bipartisan support from Congress behind him. Great. Well, thank you, Representative Delbene. Um, There's great responses to, to these questions. And this is certainly a timely topic that we'll be talking about for quite some time, even post-ministerial in a few weeks. So thank you so much for being here. And uh, we hope you continue your efforts in Congress to, to rally support for the EGA. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Great, and I'd like to turn uh, the discussion over now to our panelists that are joining us. Uh, we have Maureen Hinman, who is co-founder and chairman of the Silverado Policy Accelerator, and my Cato trade colleague, James Bacchus. Uh, if you have questions, I encourage you to use the Slido uh, question box and also to go on Twitter or Facebook using the hashtag Cato Trade, and we'll compile those questions. If you have them while the panelists are talking, Please don't wait, just drop them in and, and we'll get to them accordingly. All right, so where should we begin? Uh, I, I think there's a lot of thoughts that have been triggered in my head from, from listening to Representative Delbene's comments and it, it sparked a lot of uh, interesting thoughts on, on my end in terms of the negotiations themselves and, and the way that they could be morphed and changed over time. And Maureen, I'd like to start with you because uh, the comment Representative Delbene made about 
perhaps looking at a smaller group of countries to move forward on these talks, not taking it multilaterally to WTO. Um, you know, it reminds me of something that, that you wrote in, in talking about why countries would want to negotiate uh, a trade agreement on environmental goods in the first place. Uh, you've noted that countries would negotiate for two reasons. One, they need to access to foreign environmental technology to meet demand. And second, they want market access for domestically produced environmental goods. Now, undergirding this, however, are the shared values for high environmental standards. Uh, could you elaborate on this a bit and, and, and reflect about how that may uh, facilitate or, or hinder talks on the EGA and how that may speak to some of the concerns that Representative Delbane had mentioned? Yeah, thank you so much. You know, and I, I lived through in, in, in slow and painful um, um, slow motion the, the decline of EGA um, in the room uh, in, over several instances. So. I have a lot of uh, personal experience to draw on and the, the, the negotiation is very important to me and I ultimately should be important to the world because we should not be taxing at the border the technologies that we need to get there on carbon mitigation and other environmental values. And I think that's a principle that we just need to continue to remind everyone of. Um, and to that effect, you know, when the world is working in good, as it should and in good faith, partners are negotiating in good faith. Uh, there's a technology transfer aspect of environmental goods liberalization that is very wholesome, uh, where countries with higher environmental standards achieve larger markets and greater trade with one another, and countries aspiring to improve environmental controls have the benefit of duty-free access to relevant technologies. And this really bears out in the data. If you plot countries uh, uh, <clears throat> by their environmental market per capita against their environmental stringency scores, the relationship is both positive and very linear. Um, and that's irrespective of how large or developed a given country might be. So you have this strong connection between investment in environmental goods and services and environmental um, compliance uh, and, and stronger environmental regimes. Um, this dynamic should have facilitated a completion of EGA on its own, but um, we had to deal with a major structural impediment in the form of a large non-market, non-democratic partner that despite of being the world's number one exporter of environmental technologies, and I'll underscore Representative Delbeni's point, um, uh, has grossly in inadequate environmental controls and has some of the highest tariffs for environmental goods, providing little or no incentive for us to complete EGA. Um, China's annual domestic market for environmental goods and services stands at just under $110 billion. If China were investing in environmental protection at the same rate as the United States, um, its domestic environmental goods and services market would top $1.7 trillion, so, so almost double what the world exports. Um, WTO plurilaterals uh, still require an agreement to cover most of the trade, so um, we need large economies and traders like China in the deal if we're going to pursue a, a WTO um, deal. Um, I think that it makes perfect sense right now to keep work going in other fora and uh, start really drilling down in some of the other sort of technical issues that we encountered in EGA, which, which is you know, simply what is an environmental good and do we have the means and the customs nomenclature to actually uh, effectively eliminate those tariffs and trade. That's interesting. And, you know, that, that leads me to the question for Jim, actually, in terms of trying to understand how we can, you know, get these negotiations done at the WTO. And if, and if that's possible, I mean, the WTO has been in a persistent state of crisis now for a few years. Uh, no new negotiations have been concluded since 2013. Uh, on the EGA, we have 46 members that have participated in these negotiations, representing nearly 90 percent of trade and environmental goods. Uh, so, Jim, my question for you is, is there enough political will out there to conclude a deal? And what do you think are the major roadblocks, China? And is there something else there, too? Well, well thank you, Nindu, and thank you all. First of all, I'd like to congratulate and thank Congresswoman Delbane for her leadership on this issue and uh, uh, for that of the uh, New Democrat Coalition uh, in the House, of which I was formerly uh, a member and uh, one of the originators <laughs> uh, 30 odd years ago. Uh, and as an aside, I'd like to encourage her and the New Democrats, if they have not already done so, to 
take an equal look at the question of uh, trade barriers, uh, especially tariffs, uh, to uh, trade in um, medicines and other medical goods, which is of equal uh, uh, urgency in the WTO. Uh, getting back to the issue at hand, uh, I, I won't repeat anything uh, Maureen said. I agree with everything she said, and she certainly worked long and hard to transform this idea into a reality. Um, and I'll simply underscore that the implication of what she said is that China is not really interested in lowering uh, trade barriers themselves because they don't actually protect the environment through their regulations, so they don't need uh, these imports. Uh, that certainly needs to be changed for the sake of China, not to mention everyone else. Um, from the U.S. perspective, this is a no-brainer, as uh, Congresswoman Del Bene explained. This makes sense in terms of fighting climate change. It makes sense in terms of protecting the environment. It makes sense in terms of promoting um, um, economic growth and job growth as uh, as part of a worker-centered trade policy, whatever that is. We have to wait and see what uh, that uh, truly becomes. Um, here, um, I would point out that the IEA came out of, with a new report just the other day in which they said that, well, um, with all the previous promises that have been made uh, for uh, carbon emissions through uh, national voluntary pledges and, and with all that have been made uh, beyond that recently, if all of those promises are kept, we have a shot at holding um, global warming to 1.8 C uh, by the end of this century. Uh, well, we're at 1.1 C now. Our goal is 1.5 C. And um, for all of we Americans who think those are low numbers, those are uh, not Fahrenheit numbers. Multiply those by 1.8 uh, each, and you'll see the Fahrenheit uh, degree increases. But this only underscores why, in addition to making promises, we actually have to do something. And I applaud what my fellow Democrats are trying to do in the House and the Senate. Uh, I'm among those who think we should be doing a lot more. And my guess is the Congresswoman agrees with me, but she's trying not to let the perfect be the enemy of good and taking what can be gotten right now, which I would also uh, be doing. Um, I'll simply say that from an American expect perspective, uh, uh, irrespective of the foot dragging of the Chinese, th this cannot be done unless the United States fully engages uh, on this issue in Geneva. And I'm disappointed to hear uh, the uh, reaction that uh, not only uh, Congresswoman Del Bene, but 70 odd other Democrats and a lot of key Republicans have gotten from the administration. Why in the world wouldn't they make this a priority for because uh, uh, they have so many reasons to make it so. Um, I, I, I'm concerned that they're not making uh, this a priority. These issues have been ongoing now for 20 years since I was serving as chairman of the appellate body. Uh, these uh, these uh, negotiations began a long time ago. Uh, they've uh, 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 failed for 20 years. Um, Democratic and Republican administrations alike have failed more than once each in concluding them. Uh, as uh, Maureen will tell you, the Trump administration didn't even try. Uh, it, it was the fault of the Chinese that the negotiations uh, failed at the very end of the uh, Obama administration. It wasn't the fault of the Americans. But um, the Trump administration wasn't interested in uh, fighting climate change, uh, wasn't interested in protecting the environment, and uh, certainly wasn't interested in lowering barriers to trade. So uh, it let those negotiations fall away. The only way they're going to be resurrected in a way that will work is um, if the United States takes the lead, and we're not doing that now. Uh, let me make one substantive observation to the Congresswoman in terms of uh, uh, tactics for going forward, uh, just for her further thought, 
I, I am, of course, very much in favor of extending uh, this focus on environmental goods in this proposed agreement to include environmental services. That makes all the sense for everyone in the world, including, of course, the United States, where 75% of our uh, economy uh, is uh, services, so something that's often overlooked by uh, trade negotiators uh, in administrations of all kinds. Uh, my own state of Florida is more than 90% uh, services uh, as an economy. And so I'm very much in favor of that. And increasingly, the environmental goods and services are uh, embedded uh, one with another. It's hard to separate them. Uh, so uh, this must be ultimately a part of any plurilateral agreement. The question I have is whether at this point, when but for the foot dragging of uh, China, India, a couple of others, uh, we may be close to uh, an agreement on which we can build in the future. Should we insist on adding services now? Uh, the analogy uh, I would draw is to the recent initiative of the United States, the submission of the United States in the fisheries negotiations. Here at the very end of another 20 years of negotiations, we add in the question of um, uh, labor rights. And here too, I agree as a matter of policy uh, with the administration, I'm very much in favor of the policy that uh, the Biden administration uh, is uh, suggesting here. But um, meantime, uh, our, our, our fish production worldwide is in dire jeopardy. Should we, being as close as we are to conclude an agreement now, go ahead and conclude that agreement, or should we add new issues in the 20th year? So, so that's my question. Uh, uh, I, I'm not seeking an answer today. I just wanted to raise the question for the Congresswoman uh, for her further thought in, uh, in, in trying to help the administration when it finally gets around to doing this, frame what it's asking for. Uh, and uh, of course, I'm available uh, if I can be of any help in uh, doing that. Uh, anyway, I'd like to uh, uh, leave um, uh, the rest for questionings, uh, but on a, on a personal note, I'd like to uh, ask the Congresswoman to uh, say hello to me for my uh, uh, good friend and former colleague, uh, Governor Inslee of the state of Washington, a man I supported for President of the United States. Absolutely. I'm sure we can pass along that that message. And, uh, you know, you, you touched upon some some things that I think I would like to get Maureen's sort of feedback on uh, and to have her comment a bit. But one thing that I think would be helpful to, to clarify for the audience uh, in particular, so when you talk about environmental services, now, Maureen, you were involved in negotiations. Um, could you give us a, a little bit of a overview of, of what it would mean to have trade environmental services? What kind of, of services are we talking about here and, and how might that benefit the United States in particular? Thank you. I think that um, Jim rightly points out that we've had this 20 year um, uh, long you know, season on trying to negotiate on the goods themselves. And, and, and there's quite a bit of definitional issues around uh, the goods. And furthermore, we have definitional issues around the services, though a different type of definitional issue. Um, the type of services to answer your question could include uh, for, you know, on the US side is a, a lot of engineering, consulting services, a lot of um, high-end sort of chemistry and chemicals. Um, there's quite a bit of different, uh, quite a bit of chemicals disciplines that apply to in, uh, environmental remediation and other, and other important um, environmental remedies. Um, the, there's a number of just basic everyday services. So, you know, uh, sanitation services can be included in that, water, water distribution services, energy distribution services. I think they all are sort of fairly qual uh, qualified as, as an environmental service. One of the key challenges, I think, on, on liberalizing those services is that our, our current CPC codes don't really, um, uh, aren't very good at codifying what, what is and isn't an environmental service. It's, it's an analog to the harmonized system codes that we grappled with in EGA. And uh, the bigger challenge there is that if you're you know, working on a big project and, and, and you're an engineer in an engineering firm, um, you may not be really billing your time 
uh, between your environmental functions and your non-environmental functions. And then there's the question of, okay, so is every function on say an, an environmental project, say like building a, you know, a solar array or developing a wastewater treatment plant is, is every service there environmental inherently? So you can start to see as a, from a negotiator's perspective, how the, those services definitions start to get really sticky really fast. Absolutely. And it's never been, I think, an easy thing. It's been one of the more difficult things throughout all the negotiations that we've had to date has been trying to define, you know, where where those lines are and, and what products are covered. Um, but that also brings me to sort of the the challenges beyond just the negotiation side of it. And we talked a lot about the foreign obstacles uh, to getting a negotiation done. There's also domestic obstacles, things that, that Jim actually touched upon in, in his comments as well. Um, so Maria, I'm going to stay with you for a bit and ask you uh, to talk a little bit about uh, something that, that you've termed you know, green mercantilism, uh, which threatens progress on environmental goods uh, you know, getting completed in the next you know, foreseeable future. But the Biden administration has, has put a lot of emphasis uh, on boosting U.S. exports of clean energy. Uh, and there's also a proposal in the broader reconciliation bill uh, to offer tax credits for American made electric vehicles. Now, what do you make of this approach? You know, isn't it at odds with improving environmental outcomes for Americans uh, and worldwide? And how do you square that circle here? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's a really we're living in a complex world. And so to echo what both Jim said and Representative Del Beni had, Del Beni had to say, um, you know, we have a very competitive um, environmental technology industry that may or may not be sort of on the consumer side supported by tax incentives. I'm kind of agnostic on that, to be honest. I think all governments do it. Um, but the real issue for the United States is that we have a tough time sort of threading this needle where, you know, we have very low barriers to market entry in the United States in the form of low tariffs in the absence of many of the non-tariff barriers our competitors try to justify. Um, so firms can readily complete, compete domestically, foreign firms can, while U.S. firms aren't just simply aren't playing on a level field in foreign markets. Um, second and related, we have been woefully outpaced by our competitors where market access is concerned. Uh, we routinely face higher trade barriers than our class competitors. For instance, while U.S. tariffs for EGs are vanishingly low, um, the representative mentioned that for, for many products, it can be as high as 50 percent. Um, and uh, for and often times, you know, in many sectors around 10 to 20 percent for goods like water treatment, air pollution control technologies, energy efficiency technologies, smart grids and renewable energy technologies. Um, our rates tend to be below five per, five percent or below and oftentimes are zero. Um, furthermore, you know, our competitors have better market access through these through a number of preferential trade agreements. And I think this is actually kind of gets to the core of like services and standards and regulatory issues that impact the environmental um, industry. Um, uh, you know, those uh, our competitors that have preferential trade deals with with more with more markets than than we do uh, enjoy standards and regulatory treatment that's favorable government procurement treatment that's fair, favorable services treatment that's favorable and um, also get a lot of market access through their sustainable development cooperative agreements. Um, the U.S. has just 20 FTAs. The, the European Union, by contrast, has 36 major preferential trade agreements with 65 partners. Um, and this creates a real systemic um, opportunity for them and, and locks us out effectively because we have fundamentally different systems. Um, the data bears out uh, for environmental goods, as the, as the representative mentioned, you know, the U.S. has a top-notch industry, but we are routinely taking third place between behind China and the EU. Um, so we have to think about, you know, what uh, making a, our, our trade policy uh, worker-centric really means and recognize that correcting this imbalance um, <clears throat> you know, uh, starts with where we've started in, in the past, where with uh, kind of better enforcement of our own rules. And um, we've seen that through th 301 and 201 actions and the Biden administration's ongoing commitment uh, to enforcement. But simultaneously, we need to think really aggressively about carving out equ equitable levels of reciprocal market access. Um, and especially for U.S. environmental goods and services, uh, the green economy is the way of the future. If we want jobs in this country, we need to think about expanding those markets aggressively and, and doing it now because we're, we're behind in the race. Yeah. Inu, can you hear me? 
Yeah, go ahead, Jim. Yeah, if I if I might add, um, uh, if if I were still uh, in the Congress, uh, I would be trying to change the uh, reconciliation bill and before the House now in, in a number of ways, find out uh, how much it's going to really cost for one, but uh, I would be voting for it. Th that said, um, I would also be pointing out the following to my colleagues um, on the matter of domestic content requirements. Uh, domestic content requirements and abundance of empirical evidence demonstrates make neither economic nor environmental sense. Uh, uh, buying America, buying American doesn't help America. Uh, it hurts America. Uh, but beyond that, if anyone cares any longer, uh, if uh, you provide a subsidy to an industry uh, such as this electric vehicle uh, proposal uh, would do where the subsidy is conditioned on the use of uh, domestic over imported uh, inputs into your product, that's illegal. That is a prohibited subsidy under Article 3 of the WTO Agreement on the Subsidies and Countervailing Measures. And at a time when the United States is quite rightly lecturing the Chinese on their illegal subsidies, I, I cannot uh, understand the hypocrisy uh, in uh, our proposing uh, that we ourselves uh, apply more. Um, we're setting ourselves up to lose WTO cases where we might, if we're unwilling to change, uh, face the uh, threat of economic sanctions as a last resort in WTO dispute settlement. That could be uh, quite expensive for other industries in the United States that would suffer from those sanctions. We've just freed a lot of our industries from a lot of uh, uh, sanctions imposed by the Europeans, or at least prospectively, uh, uh, because of the steel deal we cut with the EU. There's some legal problems with that too in the WTO. And that was Donald Trump's fault uh, because of what he did on, on steel and aluminum illegally under international trade law. Uh, why would we consciously be going ahead to do something that is also in violation of international law? Or do we just not care anymore about such things? We Americans who've been preaching uh, the rule of law to the rest of the world for generations. Uh, segues well into the next question I actually had for you because you know I mean, looking at the landscape of, of trade negotiations, trade issues, and, and where things may be going in the future, you know trade and environment is undoubtedly one of those issues that's going to be with us for for quite some time, and it's going to require efforts not just at the domestic level as we've talked about, but also at the international level if they're going to succeed. Um, the thing that I think you rightly touch upon and, and, and concern to me is that there doesn't seem to be much energy from this administration on advancing the trade and environment agenda through liberalization. Uh, why do you think it's so important that we focused on this angle and why should we get it done now instead of later? Well, I think multilateral solutions are by far uh, the best solutions all the time because there's such uh, vastly uh, greater potential uh, for positive outcomes if those outcomes are applied worldwide. Uh, as you knew, know, know, I've already written one book uh, addressing the need to uh, reimagine uh, trade rules in light of uh, uh, climate change and uh, other aspects of sustainable development and uh, uh, I've now just finished a new book that will uh, be published by Cambridge in February, with, in which I go into much greater detail on a lot of these issues with specific proposals uh, for uh, re reimagining and, and modernizing uh, uh, the World Trade Organization and, and other aspects of international and ec economic law to address sustainable development. This, uh, this is urgent on many fronts. Uh, uh, the uh, challenges of biodiversity, for example, are uh, equally urgent to those 
posed by climate change, but have gotten much less attention. I'm going to stop there because I think our listeners would like to hear uh, more from uh, uh, Congresswoman Del Bene than they uh, uh, would from me, although I'm happy to answer any questions that uh, our viewers may have. Great. Well, I have uh, a lot of questions in the queue, actually, and I think maybe we can transition to questions from the audience now. And, and one that I just saw uh, that I flagged, which seems really pertinent to our discussions, is from Mara Lee. Uh, and she asks, should the highest efficiency products that don't necessarily use renewable energy, but could be part of a transition away from fossil fuels, be included in the EGA talks? Uh, for instance, a heat pump, hotter, hot water heaters, or mini split heating cooling systems, or induction ranges. Now, she clearly knows her EGA products. Uh, so maybe, Maureen, do you want to kick that one off with a response? Yeah, and thank you. And I'm, I'm happy to jump in there. You know, I, one thing that is, and then I've written on this, you know, there's a variety of ways to look at environmental goods. And, and the reality of the matter on climate and environment is the whole world is going to need everything and fast. Um, in terms of trade, one thing that I have proposed, and I think it is a, is a meaningful way forward, is for governments, and in the U.S. in particular, to spend this, this downtime uh, doing some analysis of what the impact of trade is on the environment uh, among these goods that we've proposed in the past. Uh, you know, a good may have a sort of inherent feeling of being environmental, like a bicycle, but I think there's a big question about whether liberalizing that good is actually going to increase its consumption and therefore reduce, you know, airborne pollutants because you're riding your bike to work versus um, taking your um, your car or taking the bus. Uh, similarly, things like you mentioned, like like heat pumps, you know, I, my sense is that if those things are more affordable compared to alternatives, you will see an increase in global consumption. And we can absolutely impute what the environmental outcomes of increased consumption looks like. It's kind of classic trade analysis, but with an environmental um, bent on it. And I think this not only achieves um, a, a cleaner, more justifiable list, it also gives the trade community an opportunity to do something that's been trying to do for a very long time, which is point out the environmental benefits of greater trade uh, on, on environmental goods specifically and, and get us to a better, a better place about the economic and environmental benefits of having a sort of global free market for environmental technology. Right. Yeah, and I think I, I read a, a paper recently that, that touched upon whether or not um, we can sort of think about the goods based on their environmental impact. And now we know that that, that in itself is a challenging thing to, to measure. And it's, like, it's not really easy uh, to do so. And maybe a study uh, by the ITC or otherwise would be welcome here to, to try to make sense of all of this and, and the impact it'll have for the United States. So um, thank you for that answer. Now, I have another question. Uh, this one's from Twitter, and it's from Simon Lester. And he asks, uh, what do you think of the carbon-based sectoral arrangement on steel and aluminum trade that was part of the recent EU-US Section 232 deal? Uh, do you see a potential here for reducing carbon emissions, or is it a distraction from more productive deals? And I'll piggyback on his question a bit and, and, and broaden it slightly to see what you, what you think, because you know, the representative raised the issue of potentially using uh, more limited fora to, to engage in these discussions, uh, particularly between the U.S. and EU um, through these clubs. What do you think of that? And will that actually help us with the ultimate goal of reducing carbon emissions and, and tackling climate change a writ large? Uh, Jim, maybe if you want to start and, and, and Maureen, if you can add in afterwards. Well, let me make an economic point and, and, and a legal and uh, environmental point. Uh, first of all, we should not be under any illusion that this is a free trade deal. The uh, steel and aluminum tariffs imposed by the Trump administration uh, were illegal uh, under the WTO, in my opinion. There was no rational uh, basis on national security for applying uh, these tariffs to our NATO allies. It's absurd on its face. And um, what the Europeans and the Americans have now done is, is not create free trade. Uh, they've uh, uh, created more managed trade um, at considerable price to uh, European producers and American consumers. And by consumers, I don't just mean 
individual consumers at retail and retail prices. I mean, uh, producers, uh, manufacturers who rely on steel as inputs and who uh, account for millions more jobs uh, than the U.S. Uh, steel industry and aluminum industry do. On uh, the environmental front, uh, if the um, United States and the EU proceed as they seem to be contemplating, these will be the uh, first uh, ever tariffs uh, imposed for climate reasons in the world. Um, they're waiting until 2024 in order to do this. Um, you also have uh, uh, this following on the heels of the uh, EU's proposed carbon border adjustment mechanism, which would apply globally and a bit more broadly beyond uh, uh, just steel and aluminum. Uh, but um, this too raises a lot of uh, legal issues uh, under the WTO. Um, rather than you know, detailing all those legal issues, what I'll say is that it would be far better for um, these uh, issues to be resolved uh, multilaterally within the WTO and instead of by ignoring the WTO and uh, courting a WTO dispute settlement. If I were the Chinese, uh, I would go to the WTO and to the COP. Uh, I'd say to the Conference of Parties on Climate Change in Glasgow uh, that uh, uh, we need to negotiate on uh, what is a legitimate climate response measure uh, that restricts trade and, and what is not. Uh, the uh, Paris Agreement doesn't include a definition. The climate negotiators, ne negotiators haven't tried to reach a definition uh, of this sort. Uh, if they could reach a definition, it will be respected by WTO jurists. If they don't, then it will be the WTO judges who will de facto become climate judges as well. If I were the Chinese, I would also follow up on uh, President Xi's recent statement that he's willing to negotiate on industrial subsidies and uh, uh, go to the WTO and say, look, we're willing to negotiate on these issues. And uh, in return, uh, we would ask that uh, we declare a moratorium on these uh, climate-related trade measures for maybe three years. And, um, and then we get serious about talking about the real concerns of uh, the United States, the EU, and some of our other trading partners. Um, uh, uh, central to those concerns is the issue of overcapacity in the steel and aluminum uh, sectors. The Chinese say they don't exist. Uh, the United States and the EU, EU, I think, uh, more credibly say that they do. Um, but also, you need to discuss some of the real uh, legal issues that have been engaged in dispute settlement, uh, but um, uh, no one is happy about. Um, uh, the Chinese uh, are not at all happy about the, the plethora of, especially U.S. trade remedies cases and the way that the United States has uh, 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 tried to apply them, uh, you know, we're pushing the envelope of WTO rules. At the same time, uh, and, and I think the Chinese are right uh, to be distressed there. At the same time, I, I, I think the United States and others are quite rightly disappointed in a WTO uh, ruling uh, that defined the nature of a public body very narrowly uh, on the question of, of when a subsidy is granted. Uh, that definition leaves out subsidies granted by uh, uh, all uh, 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 most Chinese uh, state-owned enterprises and those state-owned enterprises of other countries uh, on the reasoning that they're not uh, really exercising governmental authority. Uh, but they're owned by governments and they're acting under the direction of governments. And to me, that makes them public bodies. It, we should be negotiating uh, over this. Uh, there uh, are other issues that we ought to be dealing with multilaterally through negotiations. Otherwise, we're going to have uh, a, a trade war, uh, for, uh, a climate trade war that will uh, uh, 
uh, exceed much in, in scope and uh, in, in peril uh, the uh, current uh, trade confrontation between the United States and uh, China bilaterally. Wow, excellent thoughts. And Maureen, I want to give you a chance to react to or, or, or respond to some of the comments that, that Jim raised. Um, but please go ahead. I think Jim raises really, you know, important, hard-nosed questions about legality that we're going to need to grapple with. Um, but I, I would say that I'm probably a little bit more of an optimist in terms of the uh, ability for us to uh, incubate good solutions among partners of like mind uh, before things move up to a multilateral negotiation. Uh, to be clear, this carbon border adjustment question, it really does represent a greenfield in trade policy. And um, I think we're all uh, moving forward very quickly and it would be wise of us and our friends and, and maybe non-friends to really think about the templates that were provided for us in the past. You know, the GATT did not start out as a as a 166 member organization. It was just, it was just a few countries, right? Um, so I do think it makes sense for us to start thinking about what those models are now. I think that carbon border adjustment, and I just published a, a blog on this last week, presents a number of unique challenges uh, in terms of uh, accounting for carbon, in terms of how we're, we're going to, to trade, where the benefits are going to be distributed, and then how we're going to treat uh, you know, the, the benefits that we get from existing regulation and maybe even it could be interpreted as the subsidy for non for non enforcement of regulations uh, uh, with regard to to those compliance costs uh, and balance those out with with any sort of cost for, for carbon. I, I think those are really complicated questions, but we have good um, we've got sort of some good templates and trade policy to, to, to solve those questions. I think it's going to be um, the world does not have time for us to spend 20 years in the WTO. So to the degree that member state uh, members can really start working together and come up with some functional models, I think that will move everyone forward faster. Um, and um, to the extent that, that we, you know, we're, we're thinking about these sort of complicated legal questions, I, I do think that we're getting to the place with the WTO where we need to start thinking about um, how we're interpreting things like subsidies and, um, you know, how, uh, what the you know whether we want to want to reap environmental benefits first and worry about getting sued later, and I know that'll set Jim's ears on fire. But well, well, <laughs> let me let, let, let me say here that um, I agree with much that Maureen said, and you know uh, one of the main themes of my most recent book was that we need to proceed plurilaterally within the WTO in order to build up multilateral agreements over the long term. That, of course, is how we uh, built up the gap to where it could become the WTO uh, in the first place. So, yeah, I, I agree with her on that. And I also agree about broadening the nature of subsidies to include environmental damage, which I've long advocated. Uh, my problem here is that uh, unless I miss it, neither the U.S. nor the EU has said they're going to try to do this plurilaterally within the WTO. Uh, and nor have they said that they're going to try to do this consistently with their WTO obligations. Um, I, I, I'm in favor of, of climate clubs, but uh, climate clubs can't just ignore uh, uh, WTO obligations when the members of the club are members of the WTO. Uh, they must be done in a way that uh, uh, can be uh, perceived uh, as consistent with WTO obligations. This may, uh, this may mean offering benefits to members of the club rather than penalties uh, to those who are not members of the club. Uh, you know, that's how we have uh, uh, been able to do the generalized uh, system of preferences for more than half a century now. Uh, you know, there, there are other ways to look at these things, and my concern is that uh, they're only looking uh, at these issues in terms of trade penalties. And uh, I'm not sure that's right or that's going to work. I am sure that it will lead to a prolonged confrontation within the WTO uh, over the uh, climate-related aspects of trade that uh, uh, the world doesn't need and certainly the WTO uh, does not need right now. I'd, I'd really appreciate something more than uh, a soundbite from USTR 
uh, that uh, they're interested in uh, being uh, a, a, an effective part uh, of the WTO. That's all we've really gotten so far. At least our new USTR under President Biden has been willing to go to Geneva and speak to members of the WTO. Bob Lighthizer didn't do that when he was USDR under President Trump, but that's a pretty low bar. Uh, I, I think we should set the bar much higher in terms of our expectations of our own country in, in trying to lead toward freer trade and also uh, lead in the fight against climate change. And uh, they're setting uh, the bar not high enough in, in my uh, regard. Well, I think in, I in the spirit of, of setting that bar very high, um, I, I would say, you know, one thing that, that's interesting about uh, the way the negotiations have unfolded, and maybe where they could go, uh, is to look at sort of the, the change in, in the product categories over time. And, and we just look at historically how much technology has advanced and changed and how we need to keep up with that. Um, I have one question I wanted to squeak in, which is related to this, and it comes from Houston Scott. And he asks, uh, how can the WTO more effectively form EGA negotiations so that the final resolution becomes a living agreement to adjust for this so we can have a more pragmatic outcome. Uh, Maureen, maybe you want to you touch upon this as you were involved in negotiations. And is that even possible? Yes, this is, a, this is the good news about EGA. This was the thing that all members agreed, and there was really never any dispute over the idea of a living agreement and the idea that we were going to not um, take the ITA template where we have to renegotiate every five to seven years, but really have a living agreement and have a mechanism built into the plural lateral, lateral to keep pace with uh, innovation. And, you know, I thought that was one of the, you know, best features of the deal that there was going to be an infrastructure in, established inside the WTO to have this regular input and to, you know, on an annual or triannual basis, really be updating the list very regularly among members. And also, you know, really trying to sweep more members in over time. Um, you know, negotiations are tough, and and as Jim knows, like the bigger the group, the harder it is to 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 get to make everybody happy. Um, but the idea was that we were we were we had this, you know, uh, we had critical mass in EGA uh, in the original negotiations, so we could we could start the ball rolling with a good set of products, um, and those would have you know lowered tariffs on an MFN basis. And then over time, you start rolling in other countries and maybe think of um, some additional mechanisms, you know, that we could have done unilaterally. I've always been a big, you know, and I think Jim alluded to this, I've been a big fan of the idea of an environmental preferences program. Great. And I think we are getting close to running out of time here. And I just want to say um, thank you to, to Maureen uh, and to Jim for your, your excellent contributions today uh, and responding to the thought-provoking comments from Representative Delbene. I think we'll all have a long discussion about these uh, in, in the months and, and maybe years to come. Hopefully, we can wrap up the, the talks before then. Uh, and I also want to thank the audience uh, for joining us today and participating so actively. We had some great questions. I apologize we didn't get to all of them but please uh, send us your questions through through Twitter and we'll try to answer them there or through Facebook um, and, and we'll continue that conversation. Our event video will be posted online uh, for those of you who, who are missing it uh, and maybe want to watch it again. So thank you again so much for joining us uh, and, and let's hope we can continue uh, discussions on this timely topic uh, in the future.